this is Michelle, and she's going to introduce me. Because that's my only job. And then you can bet around how we're doing now. Thank you. Before I introduce Huck, I'm going to tell you about next week is um, owl migration and ecology. Uh, naturalist Sean Beckett is coming. So she then. All right. Can I say something about owls? Oh, you can. Do you, do you know? I don't know if you have it in Montpelier. I live in Burlington. We have crows that go by the hundreds to a tree, thousands sometimes. And a bunch of crows is called a murder of crows. Yes, indeed. And the reason they go to trees, I looked it up. Why do all these thousand crows go to one tree? And probably the reason is because they're afraid of owls, which might eat them. And so if they're all together, maybe the owls will be frightened and not eat them. That's all I have to say about owls. Is, it, is a group of owls called a senate? Who knows? No, a group of owls parliament. is called a murder. Parliament. No, owls. A parliament. A parliament. A parliament. A parliament. Close. Of crows. A of crows owls. Is murder. Of owls yeah, is yeah. parliament. Crows. Hi, Cynthia. So, my name is Michelle Champeau. I'm on the program committee, and if you're interested in joining us, we would love to have you. You can speak to me or to Marge about joining us. Now, I have to confess, I wasn't excited about this program. And then I read. I got it. Got it. And then I read um, that Huck had written a, an essay called "Poetry for People Who Don't Read Poetry." I thought, okay, I was worried enough. <laughs> and then I saw the seventh day um, uh, article, article about you that you called him a poet, a poetry professor in Politico, and I thought. Oh. So I, I have now switched over to being excited about it. This is. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm doing the, I'm doing okay. the advanced technology. Which Huck Gutman, you can ask him about his nickname later. <clears throat> He's a professor emeritus of English from UVM. He is, was, some of you may know, he was the political advisor to our Bernie. Um, I was his chief of staff. Chief of staff and senior policy Com advisor yeah. and co-author of his memoir, Outsider in the White House. He um, was also twice a Fulbright Scholar to both Portugal and India. Um, and he has written, co-authored several books and written a lot See, of essays broken. for monthly review. Um, the Washington Post wrote an article on him and said, he brings poetry and verse to Senate College. That may be an uphill fight. I think he snuck them into their email. I did. I'm going to talk about that. Okay, good. It's going to be time. And also they wrote that he's an expert at coaxing students into functional relationships with poems. Sounds good. I love a bridge. Uh, I don't know time. what a functional relation is. <laughs> That can, means that can you're I not start? afraid of them anymore. Can you finally start? Can I read the last thing you said about Wordsworth? Okay. Um, so in addition to calling him uh, revolutionary and the most important poet in the last 250 years, he called him a strange yet breathtaking poet who resisted writing poems that preemed self-referentially about being a poem. See now she's taking everything, thank you, that I was going to say. <laughs> Anyway, you've got to love it. This Thank you, Michelle. Got me. <laughs> uh, uh, let me start by uh, saying something about being in Washington, where I worked for Bernie for six years. Uh, I found Washington a very strange and hostile place. I, mean, I actually liked a lot of the people there. I, I'll speak a little louder, sure. I found Washington, is, is, can you hear me now? Strange and hostile place. I, I liked the people I met there, but as you might imagine, Washington is not Mount Pillar, and people have very little connection to anything except other people in Washington. And I would get very upset in meetings the first two years when Bernie was in the Senate. I worked on the Education Committee, and then afterwards I was his chief of staff. I, I'd get very upset that people would be talking about education who'd never been teachers. 
who had no idea what went on in classrooms. They said, oh, we need tests. I'm going to talk about tests today. <laughs> we need tests, and, and we need to make sure people know these things. And I kept thinking, that's not it at all. And in those days, we had these kind of precursors of cell phones called Blackberries. And I would pull the Blackberry off my belt, and I would type in Wordsworth, and I'd type up a poem, and I'd say, listen to this, and I'd read them a poem. Well, it didn't work very well. Uh, but I, I think I, I'll, I'll read you a couple of poems I read to them. And then afterwards, I thought, these people are really out of touch with what I, I, this is not a diatribe against Washington. I, I actually like many of the people I work with. But whatever it is that is part of human life, how we live, how we learn, what we think about dying, how we relate to other people, they're not interested. They're interested in policy, and they learned about policy in graduate school. It's a very strange way, in a way, to run a country. So I started up a list of people who I sent poems to. Cynthia, who's in the back, gets them, right? My wife gets them. Uh, and I'm going to pass around a list asking for your name and your email. I won't sell it to anybody, give it to anybody. Uh, if you want to be on that list, you can opt. It's an opt-out list. You can get off the list easily. And, and every two or three weeks, I send out a, a, a kind of I don't know, it's an essay about a poem. I, I talk about a poem, and, and it's meant for people who don't know much about poems, which is all of us. I mean, people who, who are very proud of themselves. Walt Whitman says, have you felt so proud to get at the meanings of poems? Meaning that he's a, you know, he's a Democrat. He thinks everybody counts, not just people who teach poetry like me. So. Um, I send these out, and I'd be very happy if you'd sign up. I, I have about over 3,000 people listed. Some are dead names. I don't call them out. So it's probably about 2,200. It's the largest poetry list in the United States, actually, yeah, which tells you something about poetry. So I'm going to start out uh, talking about Washington, as I just did, and about sending out that list in my sense that uh, Wordsworth was important. And I'm going to talk about Wordsworth as a poet, but also Wordsworth as a shaper of who we are today, because I think he's... the lights above turned out? Oh, sure. That's better. Better. Okay. Now you're going to have to read the poems in front of you by the dim lights, but they'll be up here, too. So... Um, I worked in Washington, and I, I had this sense that people didn't really get how people felt about things and how they dealt with the problems of their lives. And I've discovered, uh, now that I'm retired from teaching at UVM, um, that I think I, I'm really interested in the history of ideas and also the history of feelings. I'm not, today we think everything is in practices and how people cook dinner and what they shop for, but I think ideas and feelings and feelings as expressed in artworks like poems and music and paintings and sculpture, I, I think those things really matter. And that's the, the way in which I'm going to talk about Wordsworth. And I'm going to start off being really full of ideas in philosophy by, by looking at Wordsworth through a philosopher. So we're going to look at Wordsworth through the lens to start with of a philosopher I came to uh, pretty late in my life named Johann Gottfried von Herder. He was a, he was, is this okay? He was a, a German philosopher, kind of forgotten, much too hard to read, 70 volumes, all in German, even in translation, they're unreadable. So I approached him through a, a historian named Isaiah Berlin, who wrote a book about what he called the counter-revolution, uh, the, the, the counter-enlightenment, pardon me. The Enlightenment was what, what we think of as the 18th century, right? It, it was called by other names, it was the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. There are people, as it went along, who said, mm, maybe reason ain't so good. Maybe we need something else. And one of those people was 
Herder, and I, I mention him because Wordsworth's great friend and contemporary was a man named Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and Coleridge was known as a transcendentalist, and he got everything from Kant, and I thought, oh, that must be Wordsworth. I don't think so. I think Wordsworth got a lot from Herder, whether he read him or not. And Herder, if you go through all of his stuff, which I haven't, but I've read Berlin, 90 or 100 pages of him, and I've read a bunch of Herder, he has three central ideas which I want to introduce, and then we'll turn to Wordsworth. One is something called Das Volk, the folk, the people. Got a little bit perverted under Hitler. A lot perverted, right? The Nordic race. But for Herder, it, it meant that the, the place where culture resides, the place where culture is made, the place in which we live and think and breathe is among other people, not big poets, but the people. I, he would have a great influence, although I don't think he ever read him on Walt Whitman, one of my favorite poets. He also said that we talk too much about ideas that are also feelings, and we have to consider feelings. Both of these folk and feelings are going to be very important to, to Wordsworth. If you don't think Herder was important, you all remember the era of folk music, right, in the 1960s? Right out of Herder. Right out of the child ballads, which were collected after Herder. Uh, folk tales from uh, the Grimm brothers? Right out of Herder. So folk, feelings, and then he was terribly interested in language. He thought language is what we lived in and used, and that's going to be terribly important to Wordsworth. Now here's Wordsworth, as you see, he was born in 1770. Here's the horrible thing, oh, poor Wordsworth. Wordsworth wrote all his great poems between 1797, when he was 27, and maybe 1805. And after that, he lived for another 45 years, he became poet laureate, he wrote maybe one good poem. Right? I, he, he had this, this, he wasn't a youth anymore, but this young maturity when he wrote great poems, and then he stopped. And it's one of the things about poems that is truly miraculous. I, I sent out a thing in, to my poetry list about a poet named uh, Arthur Rimbaud, who was a French poet. He stopped. You, you won't believe this. He stopped writing poetry when he was 18 years old. He was one of the great French poets. And, and I'm sure you all know that Keats and Shelley died at a young age. Keats at 26, Shelley at about 30. So uh, Wordsworth wrote from about 1798. We're going to look at poems from 1798 to 1802. Just those four years. And um, he died only in 1850. Here's the young Wordsworth, famous portrait, kind of dreamy, thinking of things. One of the miraculous things about Wordsworth, I, I just don't know how to deal with this. I read a couple of biographies of him, and one of them, I can't remember the name of it anymore, said all of Wordsworth's friends when he was in college knew he was the guy. He was the genius of the age. He did poorly in college. He, was, he didn't accomplish anything. But they said, this guy thinks about the world, feels about the world differently from the rest of us. So that's what I'm going to try and talk to you about, how he felt and thought about the world. Here's Wordsworth, a famous line of his. He's a great writer of lines. He said, we poets in our youth begin in gladness, but thereof come in the end to despondency and madness. And I'm going to suggest it's that youth and not the young poet of 18, but the youth of five and six that is central to Wordsworth. We will spend the rest of our time together about that. Here's the old Wordsworth. As far as I can tell, he spent the last part of his life fiddling with his chimney so it would draw right so his house wouldn't be filled with smoke. Uh, now, he, I, I, he did a, a, a remarkable thing. I had a teacher in college who said, oh, yeah, he had Coleridge part, published lyrical ballads in 1798, one of the great moments in English poetry. I didn't believe it. I believe it now. And we'll go into that. But the Lyrical Ballads, which was a slim book of ballads are four poems and stanzas of four lines. We'll go into ballads in a minute. 
he, he wrote it in 1798, he wrote an introduction in 1800, and he wrote another introduction for the third edition in 1802, and that's what this is quoted from. It's, it's an extraordinary piece of writing, and mainly, he says a lot of good things, but mainly he says he doesn't want to be a poet like we think poets are supposed to be. Lots of flowery language. That's what they used in the 18th century. Some of you, sometime in your past, may have read Alexander Pope. Has anybody read Alexander Pope? That's what I thought. I mean, a couple of years ago, I reread Alexander Pope. That guy was phenomenal. But he, everything he wrote was in couplets, two lines each two lines rhyme with each other, and then two lines rhyme with each other, and another two lines rhyme with each other. It seems so outmoded, and he wrote in fancy language. I'm there just spectacularly good. And having reread Pope, I noticed that lots of 20th century poets writing couplets too, they just are not what is called end stop. There's not a period at the end of the second line, they just keep on going to the next line. Something kind of nice about couplets. Anyway, Wordsworth says, I'm not going to use showy language, I'm going to use ordinary language, the language that people speak. Sometimes called the Vulgate, more often in our own day, uh, uh, called the vernacular. So he says, the principal object then, I need my glasses, I've been taking them off. The principal, this is from the process. The principal object then, which I proposed to myself in these poems was to choose incidents and situations from common life. Whoa! I mean, that, that, that's gonna pass by, right? Just ordinary stuff that happens every day. Not. People on the ramparts holding off the barbarian hordes, just ordinary stuff, which I, I think is extraordinary. And he says, and to relate or describe throughout as far as was possible in a selection of rat language really used by men, like what we talk every day. I have proposed to myself to imitate and as far as possible to adopt the very language of men. He was a sexist, he meant men and women. His best friend at that time was Coleridge, and his other best friend was his sister, Dorothy. I ask what is meant by the word poet. What is a poet? To whom does he address himself? And what language is to be expected from him? Those are great questions. I've wrestled with them all my life. And he says, he is a man speaking to men. Just use common, ordinary language. So we're going to turn to a poem called We Are Seven. And I choose this because it's one of the lyrical ballads, and it's about as simple as a poem can get. It's an arithmetic poem. You don't have to turn on a lot of brain cells during this poem. A guy sees a kid, and he says, how many are you in your family? And the kid says, seven. And the kid relates, you know, two are here, and two are here, and two are lying in the churchyard in their burial plots, and me. He says, well, you, know, you got seven kids and two are dead. You're five. She said, no, we're seven. He said, no, you're five. She says, we are seven. He says, no, take two from seven, it leaves five. It's an arithmetic poem. That's the whole poem. <laughs> right? So, uh, and, and we're going to go through it now. You have it in front of you. It's an extraordinary poem. It's a ballad, and I, I'll refer you to the third stanza here because this, it, it starts out, you know, with, with that line means that a certain part of the line is missed, and, and, and great poets violate the very rules they set up, so sometimes there are more or less syllables than we expect. But a typical ballad stanza runs like this. In fact, it's called a ballad stanza, or it's also called a hymn stanza, or it's also called uh, a common meter, uh, and, and it, it has alternating lines. We can grow fancy of, of iambic tetrameter and iambic trimeter, three, uh, four stress syllables, three stress syllables, and it rhymes A, B, A, B, the first rhyme, line, right, air rhymes with fair and clad with glad. You see that child? Huh? I, I, but not in that stanza, I said that was an odd stanza. Girl and curl and sand and head, and it'll go throughout the poem, right? So it's a ballad. 
That's the form of balance. He's going back to an old form. He's not writing those wonderful couplets of Pope. He's not writing the great blank verse of Milton and of Shakespeare, although later in the volume he'll write a poem in blank verse, which we'll see. So it, it's a ballad. And I, I, I think we want to kind of cross out the first stanza. He, he wrote it, but in it he's telling us something, and afterwards he shows us what he tells us at the beginning. And if you want to be a writer, some of you are writers, showing is always better than telling. You show some, something, it's better than telling somebody what it is you have to say. So uh, I'm going to read the poem, and you're going to see it's, it's all about arithmetic. It, it doesn't seem hard. It seems kind of almost childish. There aren't any words in here that, that a second or third grader wouldn't know. And this is an ordinary language and ordinary stuff about a guy and a girl, right? And, and yet I think it's an extraordinary poem. It's a, one of the hinges on which our whole culture turns. So let's, let's look at the poem. A single child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb, what should it know of death? I met a little cottage girl. She was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick with many a curl that clustered round her head. She had a rustic woodland air, and she was wildly clad. Her eyes were fair and very fair. Her beauty made me glad. Sisters and brothers, little maid, says the guy. How many may you be? How many? Seven in all, she said, and wondering looked at me. And where are they, I pray you tell, she answered. Seven are we, and two of us at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea, and two of us in the churchyard lie, my mother, sister, and my brother, and in the churchyard cat, cat, excuse me, and we need to go on, right? And, and two of us in the churchyard lie beneath the churchyard tree. Uh, excuse me. I got ahead of myself. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother, and in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my brother, with my mother, right? Two in Conway, two at sea, two in the churchyard, me, seven. I could count. I'm a kid. And he says, you say that two at Conway dwell, and two are gone to sea, yet ye are seven. I pray you tell, sweet maid, how this may be. I mean, two of them are dead. There are only five. She says, then did the little maid reply, seven boys and girls are we, two of us in the churchyard lie beneath the churchyard tree. You run about, my little child. Your limbs they are alive. If two are in the churchyard laid, then you are only five. <laughs> two are dead. Well, this is not the most complicated of poems. And yet, and yet, I, I have much to say about this. And you'll see much in this. Their graves are green. They may be seen, the little maid replied. Twelve steps or more from my mother's door, and they are side by side. And, and then she says, and I hang out with these kids, right? Even if they're dead. She says, my stockings there I often knit, my kerchief there I hem, and there upon the ground I sit and sing a song to them. And often after sunset, sir, when it is light and fair, I take my little bowl of porridge, my little porringer, and eat my supper there. The first that died was Sister Jane. In bed she moaning lay till God released her of her pain, and then she went away. I, I, I want to just pause here for a second. Um, I know, know of two very, very great poems I actually thought. The mic is not working. I, 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 no, I wasn't close to it. I, I knew of two very great poems. I thought of bringing them in. You know, I thought, nah, it gets too confusing. But if you want, there's one by John McCrow Ransom called Janet Waking, where a girl wakes up and finds out her favorite chicken is dead. And it ends up, it would not be instructed in how deep is the kingdom of death. Kid just doesn't get death. And then there's another poem, even greater, by Elizabeth Bishop, called uh, First Death in Nova Scotia, in which her cousin dies and she just doesn't get it, because she's four or five years old. And that, that is what's going on here. This kid eh, doesn't really get death. She goes and has dinner with them, and sings to them, and tells them stories. 
So in the churchyard she was laid, and when the grass was dry, together round her grave we played my brother John and I. And when the ground was white with snow, and I could not, and I could not uh, run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lies by my side. How many are you then? Oh, guys, you know, he's a, he gets it right. They're dead. Even if you eat supper with him. How many are you then, said I, if t they two are in heaven? Quick was the little maid's reply, oh, master, they are, we are seven. But they are dead, he says, right? He's really upset. He said, you don't you get it? They are dead. Those two are dead. Their spirits are in heaven. It was thrown where it's way, for still the little maid would have her will and said, nay, we are seven. And there you have it. That's the poem. So why do I think, and why should you think, not just me, this is such an amazing poem? Well, I had, a, I had lunch with a friend of mine the other day who was going to teach this poem. He said, why, why do you like this poem? I said, well, you know, I think the poem is really about childhood and how childhood is utterly different than adulthood. Yeah, no, I'm not going to talk about that. So I don't know what he talked about. I guess he, that their graves are green and so life is eternal or something. No, 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 no. I think really, really, really what we learn from this poem is something that people never, ever understood before, that we all understand. Comes right out of Wordsworth. The children think differently than grown-ups. They live in a different world than grown-ups live in. This kid thinks they're seven. And he thinks there are five. And he thinks there are five because he has logic and reason and arithmetic. We all have logic and reason and arithmetic. But the little child doesn't. And the child thinks differently than he does. And out of that recognition, that children don't think like grown-ups, comes much of what we know. Right? Comes everything in Freud. As far as I know, Freud didn't read Wordsworth, but he should have. We'll discover this later. We'll get another poem which is even more Freudian. And I don't mean Freudian in the sense of uh, Freudian in a sex. No, children are important, and they, what happens to them is important, and they think differently from us. You can see how this is, in its own way, an attack on the Enlightenment. It's not all reason and logic. It's also how we feel about things. And she feels that there are seven. And all his logic says there are five. And there's no intercourse, conversational intercourse between them. They live in different worlds. So this poem, in very simple language, about a very simple kind of girl, who it's about how human beings maybe are not Maybe we're more complicated than we think. I was going to say not as complicated as we think. Maybe we're more complicated. Maybe in addition to all of our logic and rationality, we have other things. And I'm going to stop for a moment and tell you the story of, of Wordsworth's life and how this poem came into being. Wordsworth went to college as a mediocre student, and he went out to work, but he didn't really find any work. And a college friend of his got sick and died, and left him a chunk of money, so because he was a everybody thought he was quite a remarkable person. So he went on a walking tour through through Europe and he ended up in France in 1789. Whoa. That was the year to be in France. He says, uh, Bliss was it then to be alive, but to be young was to bury heaven. He says that in the poem. Um, so there are two revolutions going on at the end of the 18th century, right? Just as we're about to turn, no, the end of the yeah, 18th century, just as it's about to turn into 1800 and forward, that would be the 19th century. One revolution, which was going on in England and we don't think about all the time, was called the Industrial Revolution, in which instead of people spinning yarn in their houses, they had machines to spin yarn and machines to weave cloth. 
And, and the whole world we live in today, everything we use and consume, except maybe the food we eat, is a product of the Industrial Revolution. And a lot of the food we eat comes from tractor, tractor plowed farms and, and big trucks with refrigeration on them. But, so the Industrial Revolution was coming into the world, and it meant people moved from the country into the city. So little towns suddenly overnight became huge megalopolises. And, and while that revolution, which displaced people, was going on, there was a political revolution. I mentioned the French Revolution, which followed ours by 13 years. Ours was 1776. France was 1789. But ours was a kind of, you know, was a, we were wanting liberation from the mother country. It was a colonial revolution against an imperial power. <laughs> The French wanted to overthrow their government. They wanted to kill the king. They wanted to do away with monarchy and institute, what, what was their phrase? Egalité, liberté, fraternité, equality, liberty, and brotherhood. That's what the French wanted. So Wordsworth, I think, was very lucky to be a, a very, very, very great poet. I'm talking about a really great poet. You have to live in very poetical times, where, where, where somehow a society is trying desperately to find its way forward. And he lived in such a time. So he, well, he didn't really participate in the French Revolution. He watched it. He had a good friend who told him about revolutionary politics. He got very excited. He went back to Britain. The democratic government turned uh, violent, figured out that you could use guillotines. The old order, the ancien regime, was reestablished. Words were, God, depressed. I mean, the French Revolution seemed to point the way forward, and it had failed. And what was he going to do? And his answer which we're going to see in these poems, although he writes about it at great length in this long poem he wrote in 1805, began in 1798, called The Prelude. His answer was that if, if we want to figure out why we're so depressed, we got, when we started out so well, right? We poets and youth began in gladness. If we started out so well, where do we go wrong? That, that's the heart of Wordsworth's poetic endeavor, and it's the heart of what we've been trying, I think, to do forever since. How do we get back to what's really important? Because certainly, I don't mean to insult anybody here, but it certainly can't be a, a president who lies 30,000 times or 15,000 times in, in two and a half years. You remember when we were in, in grade school, all of us, right? George Washington, the president, what did we know about? He never told a lie. And now we got all these lies. How did we get here? I, I'm not faulting Trump. God knows I don't like Trump. But this is not a, a bash Trump time. This is how did we get to a time when lies and, and people staring at screens and, 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 and misinformation and, and confusion? Do you, do you know that, that crimes of desperation, suicide, uh, drug addiction, and... and, and, and uh, uh, what's the third one? Alcoholism? Uh, are, are wiping out a generation. The, the life expectancy of Americans is declining right now because so many people have lost hope. Uh, you, 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 we, we could talk about the reasons for it. I've got reasons for it. But the fact is that people have lost hope. And, and Wordsworth was one of the early peoples who lost hope and said, what's the future like? And so he came up with some answers. One was is suggested by this poem. Maybe we should look back to when we were children, we were maybe glad. When we thought that there were seven and not five, maybe. We'll find out more about that later. So here are two poems I used to, I, I would actually read from these poems to my colleagues in the Senate. Expostulation and reply means, expostulation, a fancy term, means a statement and reply. And it's going to be a colloquy. It's a, a, a two-person poem. You'll see by the quotation marks, 
separated by one stanza of description. And the, at the beginning, uh, Matthew, his friend, says, hey, Wordsworth, again, not a hard poem, Wordsworth, why do you read some books? You think that you're the first person who ever worked that walked on the face of the earth? I mean, Plato was here before you, and Socrates, and Aristotle, and, 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 and Sophocles, and Aeschylus writing dramas. The Bible was here. People wrote the Bible. Shakespeare was here. Milton was here. And why are you just sitting around instead of reading? You could spend your time profitably, I'm sure. Some of you had parents who told you when you were young, stop lazing around, read. Come on, learn something. From all the people went before. That's what Matthew says to Wordsworth, right, in the beginning of this poem. And he's absolutely right. I mean, I'm a teacher. I, I spent a lot of years teaching books. And yet, Wordsworth knows he's also absolutely wrong. Why William on that old gray stone? So he's sitting on, sitting on a rock, right? Why, William, on that old gray stone, thus for the length of half a day, why, William, sit you thus alone and dream your time away? Stop daydreaming. Get to work. Read some books. Where are your books? That light bequeathed to being, beings else forlorn and blind. You would be lost and blind if you didn't have books to guide you. That's what those lines say. Up, up, and drink the spirit breeze from dead men to their kind. I mean, read some Plato, and you'll be OK. You look round on your mother Earth as if she for no purpose bore you, as if you were her firstborn birth, and none had lived before you. Don't think you're the only one who ever lived. Learn from these people. You know, I mean, they, they really knew a lot and thought a lot and, and, and read books. One, now here's this stanza of description. You notice again, we're in four line stanzas, A, B, A, B. One morning thus by Esquake Lake, which is, that's where Wordsworth grew up, is in the north of England, in the so-called Lake District, north. It's between England and Wales. One morning thus by Esquake Lake, when life was sweet, I knew not why, to me my good friend Matthew spake, and thus I made reply, and this is what I said back to him. It's now a long poem. The eye it cannot choose but see, we cannot bid the ear be still, our bodies feel where they be against or with our will. We have bodies, we have senses, we take things in, right? We, we can't stop that. So maybe books aren't all there is. I mean, I'm seeing and hearing and feeling and touching and smelling. And, nor less I deem that there are powers which of themselves our minds impress that we can feed this mind of ours in a wise passiveness. Oh my God, I would never, ever, ever have taught my students this in class. I mean, I think it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're in, they pay all this money to go to college, to learn from teachers who read books. Just sit around on a rock and take it in? I mean, come on. I mean, I think he's right. I mean, I would say that to students, but I am not class. Now when I said the sign for next time is to read this. Think you may all this mighty sum, says Wordsworth, of things forever speaking that nothing of itself will come, but we must still be seeking. Why are we always looking for things? Why don't we just kind of be in the world and take it in? Every time you go to the woods and stand and, and look at trees or look out at the snow on the branches, or listen to birds cheap. You're doing my words with advice. You're just taking it in. Then ask not wherefore here alone, confessing as I may, I sit upon this, I sit upon this old gray stone and dream my life away, my time away. So that's the end of the poem. One guy says read books, and the other guy says, ah, you know, there, there's all that, that that stuff out there that that can impress us. I'm going to skip the next slide, which just repeats one of the stanzas and has a, a, a wonderful line. From, I'm going to skip it because I'm not hooked into the internet. It has a wonderful line from Groucho Marx, who says to Margaret, whatever her name is, this big woman, Margaret Dumont, his brother has just left the bedroom and he sneaks out from under the bed. She said, but, but were you just here? And he says, uh, well, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? <laughs> you know, words worth the same. Maybe we want to believe our own eyes. So here's the, the next poem in the book, 
expostulation apply. This is called the tables turned, where he speaks to Matthew. And he says, up, up, my friend, and quit, or, quit your books, or surely you'll grow double. Right? The book you and, uh, I don't know, real you. Up, up, my friend, and clear your looks. Why all this toil and trouble? I, I have to stop here. This stanza to me, I, I, I'll confess to you. When I first read Wordsworth, I thought he really sucked. I mean, he was so boring and so unvarnished and so unlike a poet and so unable to do things that I just couldn't see him. I mean, it took me a while to open my own eyes and see what was there. And, and I think this next stanza is just gorgeous. And it's so simple, right? But we all know it's, it's about a, a, a summer day in your evening when, when the sun is going down and the yellow light of the, of the dying sun suffuses the fields, he says. The sun above the mountain's head, a freshening luster mellow through all the long green fields has spread his sweet first sweet evening yellow. Not complicated. I think pretty gorgeous. I really do. I think it's as good as a poet can write. And yet there's none of that fancy stuff that, you know, when you write poems, you, you want to use big words and impress people. Books. This is a hard one to teach. <laughs> Books, tis a dull and endless strife. Come here, the woodland linnet. A linnet's a finch. I put in parentheses what things are. How sweet his music. On my life, there's more of wisdom in it. More wisdom in a bird song than there is in a book. I, I, I mean, you know, if you have grandchildren, since you're mostly older, or children going to college, and you're, you're paying. $200,000 for them in college, and can, can you imagine saying that? But there's more wisdom in listening to a bird than what you're going to learn in school. That's what he's saying. And hark how blithe the thrassel sings. He too is no mean preacher. Come forth into the light of things. Let nature be your teacher. Uh, there's a lot of people who think that Wordsworth is a nature poet. And I suppose in some sense he is, but that diminishes what he is. He's saying that there's something better than books. Emerson, who clearly had read words where it said, who would read books when he can when they can read God directly? And we all know that feeling of being on top of a mountain, maybe about to slide down on skis, maybe just having at the top and looking down, or being in the woods, or or watching trees bud in spring and thinking, yeah, this is what life is all about. about. All that stuff in books about thesis and antithesis and synthesis and, and ideas. So he says, let nature be your teacher. And again, it's spontaneous wisdom. Sit on that old gray stone and just be passive and take it in. She has a world of ready wealth, her mind, Oops. Sorry, but you no, know, I lost this, right? You lost your mic. So okay. I'm just going to put it was, right here. I'm so sorry. She's so right here. Mm -hmm. oh, You're very nice. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. She was sneaking up on her knees, right? <laughs> okay. So nature has a world of ready wealth, our minds and hearts to bless, spontaneous wisdom breathed by health. Truth breathed by cheerfulness. And now he's going to soar, and now he's going to go even farther. He's going to say, one impulse from a springtime wood may teach you more of man, of moral even, evil, and of good than all the sages can. I would go through an impeachment, and all these lawyers are talking these big, complicated arguments, and Wordsworth is saying, just go out in the woods and think about it, and you, you'll, you'll figure it out. Sweet is the lore which nature brings, our meddling intellect misshapes the bark, beauteous forms of things we murder to dissect. Let me stop at that line. When we want to take things apart, when we want to dissect them and cut them, like we want to dissect a frog or an or, or, or embryonic pig or maybe even a human being, we have to kill them first. We don't dissect live things. And one of the problems with reading poems for many people is that 
in school, the poems were dissected. Where's the metaphor? Where's the simile? What's the rhythm? What's the, you know, and everything was taken apart. And nothing was ever put back together again. Right? And, and he said, no, no, we, 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 in order to take things apart, we have to kill them first. Why shouldn't we encounter the living thing? Enough of science and of art. Close up those barren leaves. That means leaves of a book. Come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives. I mean, these are, both these poems are of a piece. They're about the wisdom that is to be found from just looking and feeling and feeling for oneself. I won't go into it now. It's disturbing me very greatly uh, that we have this, we, 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 maybe not us. I have trouble. Do some of you have trouble with the internet and all these things? But, but it's intruding on what we call privacy and individuality and autonomy. Everything about us is known and cataloged and run through things called algorithms. Who am I? I don't know anymore. Right? And, and so, but Wordsworth is saying, you know, you could maybe feel yourself if you allowed yourself to feel and, and cut off all that extraneous stuff like the stuff we learn from books. I'm not opposed to books. I've told you that. But this is a change, a revolution in how we feel about the world. That not all the answers are to be obtained by thinking and by reason. That maybe feeling ourselves and what we want and what we need and who we are, maybe that's essential to getting to where we want to be. So I'm going to go on to another poem. This is uh, also in lyrical ballads. It's the last poem. They, they, they had, uh, oh, well, I've got, I have two more poems. I, I want to do this poem first. This was in the third edition of, of lyrical ballads. It's part of a group of five poems called the Lucy Poems about a, a lover, supposedly. Who knows? Nobody knows. Um, I think it's the most perfect poem ever written in English. I think it's perfect because what it has to say, it doesn't say. Right? So I'm going to read it to you. A slumber did my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. Rolled round in earth's diurnal course of rocks and stones and trees. The first thing we've noticed is that you know, you know, you just sometimes want to reread a poem and think about it. The first thing we notice, I think, is that the, the tenses change between the first and the second stanza. There are tenses? Why are you paying attention to that? Well, the first stanza is all in the past tense, and the second stanza is all in the first, in the present tense, right? Did, had, seen, as opposed to has, hears, sees, is rolled. There's a difference between the two stanzas, past and present. And if we go to the poem again, the first stanza is full of poems, uh, of words that have to do with appearance. Seeming, a slumber did my spirit seem. Right, right, I'm, I'm sleeping. Had no human fears. How can a human being not have fears? She seemed a thing. Now. No motion has she now. No force. All right. And the third thing we see is, is all those negatives in the third stanza. A slumber did my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. It was like, no motion has she now. A lot of negatives. No force. She neither hears nor sees. Roll around in Earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. What happens in between the two stanzas? That's what the whole poem's about. It's not in the poem. I, I felt like I was asleep. I had no fears. She seemed like time wouldn't touch her. No motion has she now. What's happened? That's the question. What's happened to her? She died. She died. 
The poem is about the death of this woman he loves, and it's not even in there. It's in between the stanzas. So the, the, the poem is about her death, and it's so odd, this poem. I mean, I get the first stanza, right? It's, I mean, it's extraordinarily beautiful. Huh? It's like I was asleep. It was like I was asleep, a slumber in my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. Uh, is there anybody here who doesn't feel the touch of earthly years? Ah, come on. Time touches us all. Can't be true. It's a seeming. And then he goes, no motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. She's dead. And then these astonishing final lines roll down in her diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. I have three questions about those, one of which I can't answer. I don't know. I don't know what the difference is between rocks and stones. I guess stones are smaller, but I don't know why he puts them in there. Poems have to be a little mysterious. To me, this is mysterious. Maybe you can tell me when, when I come to my conclusion. What's the difference between the two nouns and trees with rocks and stones and trees? What's the difference between rocks and stones on the one hand and trees on the other? Trees are alive. Trees are alive. So we have something that is, whoops, in fact, alive, right? And things that are dead. She's dead, and yet there's a, a live thing. And then it says, it seems like a contradiction. No motion has she now, no force. That's what the first line of that stanza says. And the last line he says, roll round, or third line, roll round. If she has no motion, how could she be rolled? Like rocks. Like rocks. Well, rock doesn't have motion either, and how is it rolled? The earth is one that the world comes out. Yeah, the world keeps spinning. I mean, one of the reasons people turn to poems and novels and dramas and paintings and operas and also the world is not always so simple as the rationalists would have it. You know, the great law of logic is the law of the excluded middle. It is either red or not red. Can't be both at once. Can I move something here? I'm sorry everybody, but I'm gonna uh, put this right here. No, this will be this will be fine. So, so uh, what the poem allows us to see is she's dead, and yet I suppose she's part of some larger cycle of continuing existence. Wordsworth was, in fact, uh, uh, he, he really liked Spinoza, who claimed that, right, that, that there's a universal ongoingness. I don't know. I mean, I, it's too much for me to hold Wordsworth and Spinoza in my head at the same time. <laughs> But, it, but that's what's so gorgeous about the last line. She's dead, and yet things go on without her, but also with her. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees rolled round in Earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. Um, I'll read the poem once more. It's such a beautiful poem. A slumber did my spirit seal. I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees. Roll round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and trees. And since I don't have forever, I'm going to skip the next two things. I'm going to read three poems of 1802, and actually I, I couldn't after I created this slide, I couldn't move these around. I'm going to start with this one, then go to this one, and then this one. So uh, this next one is the poem everybody knows. When an English newspaper did a poll of which poem its readers knew the best, this was the one they said. Now, this was England, of course, but you, know, you probably have all heard this poem, right? And I, I'll start out by saying this actually happened to me twice in my life. We have big experiences. 
once uh, I was with some friends in a high hill in Italy, and we, we were walking, and all of a sudden there were daffodils everywhere. And another time, I was with my wife. We were driving in the hills and mountains of Portugal, and we stopped, and there was the hillside all covered with, I think there were crocus. But the hillside was blooming, where you didn't expect it to be. So this poem is about how the poet is out walking one day, and he walks by a lake, and he sees all these naturalized daffodils, right? Just a lot of daffodils, like a lot of daffodils, like hundreds of thousands of them. He compares them to the Milky Way, all these yellow things out there. It's a kind of trite poem until the last stanza. It really is kind of trite. I saw all these yellow daffodils. They were great. OK? I wandered, and he's wandering around. You know, this is the guy who likes to sit in a rock and not have a plan. And he's wandering, you know, like a cloud going through the sky. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats or on high or veils and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Ah, I could live without it. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. Oh, give me a break, Wordsworth. He's not always great. Uh, happier than the uh, sparkling waves. Oh, yeah. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. And here's where the poem leaps into something extraordinary that we all, I think, believe after Wordsworth. And if we don't, we're the poorer for it. For oft when on my couch, sofa, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon the inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the <coughs> daffodils. It's this memory of the past when things were gorgeous and beautiful that, that can, I'll, I'll use a word he uses in the, in the brilliant in a key passage that can vivify or fructify, make fruitful his life. When he is feeling vacant, empty, and pensive, by that pensive, I, I think he means a thoughtfulness that we would equate with depression. You can correct me if you think I'm wrong. All of a sudden, when I'm lying there feeling, oh, I'm in the city and life sucks, all of a sudden, I remember those daffodils and how gorgeous and wonderful and full of bloom the life can be. And I am made new again. Because I see them in memory, the inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. Only when we are alone with ourselves can we remember such things. Next comes a poem which I did not put on the sheet I handed out. It's on the little extra sheet I gave you. This is, uh, I'm big, as you've noticed, on major claims. This has the most stunning line in the whole history of human poetry. Right? It's a line that I never fail to be shocked by. And it's about a rainbow. You, you all know this poem, right? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky, it starts, right? I, 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 I love rainbows. When I was a kid, I loved rainbows. And now that I'm grown up, I say, whoa, there's a rainbow. And when I grow old, I will love rainbows. And if I don't, I might as well be dead. That's it. That's the whole first two thirds of the poem, right? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. I, that is a great line, right? Does the heart really leap? No. But we know what it means, right? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began. So is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old or let me die. And then comes this line that is just so amazing. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be linked each to each by natural piety. What? No. Can't be. Fathers have children. Children do not beget fathers. And this is so contrary 
to what we all believe we know is the deepest of truths. We all grew up in families. Every human being grows up in a family or a surrogate family, and the child is a child, and the parent is the father or the mother. And he reverses this, what we thought we knew. The child is father of the man. And here it is, highlighted for you. What he says here, what he means here, what he understands here, what he's come upon here, what has changed for human beings ever afterwards is that we understand inside us is the child we once were. Freud said, oh, when you're a kid, have trouble with toilet training, have trouble with your father, have trouble with your mother, have trouble with uh, touching things and sex. Well, ah, that's where all your neuroses started. Uh, you can like Freud or not, but this notion that inside this Again, this is counter to the Enlightenment. Inside this serious thinking person, right? Think of all those lawyers in, 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 the, in the impeachment hearings. Inside them all is a kid saying, I don't be loved, I be loved. I mean, we understand that's who we are deep down inside. We don't let it show much. I have a, a friend, I'm going to be very political here, I have a friend who, who said, you know, when Hillary Clinton said of Bernie Sanders, who I used to work for, nobody likes him in the, in the Senate. She, he said she was being a junior high school kid all over again. Nobody likes you. Nah, 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 nah. But uh, it may be a moment of truth for her. Uh, we all have within us parts of our past, and, and it's only as we come to terms with that past that we can come to terms with ourselves. You don't have to be a Freudian to believe that. It, 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 if you want to find out who you are and what you are and, and why you deal well with the world or don't deal well with the world, a, a lot of it has to do with your childhood. We all know that. And people didn't know that before Wordsworth. Here's this guy who, who, through his thinking and feeling his way through the world, changed the way we think and feel about ourselves. OK, one more poem, and then I'm done. Confession. This is a sonnet, 14 lines. Has an octave and a sestet. Only the octave is going to be eight and a half lines long, not eight lines. And the sestet's going to be five and a half, not six. And the confession is, I taught a graduate seminar once on politics and poetry, and I spent my entire time in this seminar, again and again, as a test case, going back to this poem and, and looking the first eight and a half lines, which are brilliant. There's no better diagnosis of what ails us than Wordsworth provides. And I thought the last five and a half lines, which begin, great God, I'm proud of you. I thought that was so much empty rhetoric. I couldn't understand why he'd end such a good poem with such bad ending. I've changed. <laughs> I now think the ending is great. So here's a, the poem. I'll read the whole poem, then we'll look at the two halves, and then I'll be done. The world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending. We lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away. A sordid boon. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours and are up gathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune, it moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasantly, have sight, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. Have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. Let's look at the two halves of the poem. First half, you can see. It's just, he, you could disagree. Maybe when I'm done, you will want to disagree. I, I think he nails us. This is it. This is our modern world. Too much Walmart, too much Amazon, too much money, too much busyness looking at screens. The world is too much with us, late and soon, getting and spending. Oh, we got earn a living, we got to spend our money at Walmart, right? We lay waste our powers. And, you know, we, we, we no longer feel ourselves to be extraordinary human beings. We're just workers and buyers and sellers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given 
you know, we've become middle class and we've given our hearts away. Pretty bad bargain, a sordid boon, he says. This sea, and then now he's got some imagery. Okay, poetry is imagery. And he's thinking the sea in front of him and the ocean and the sea is reflecting up off the ocean. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, but now are kind of quiet. Everything is calm. Right? The sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are gathered now like sleeping flowers. And the winds will later, they'll blow, but right now they're like flowers, all kind of budded, right? We don't get it. We don't get it. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. I mean, that's his diagnosis of modern life. We're so involved in getting and spending that we no longer feel the things that could and should move us, like the natural world. Maybe even like the love of other people. We're just caught up in all this stuff. Watch TV, we read newspapers, we go to the store, we have to make a living, we have to worry about our checkbooks, and we lose sight of the things that could anchor us in what is real, which is the natural world and our place in it and what we value. So that's what I taught for a semester. I kept coming back to this moment. How does Marx see it? How does Gramsci see it? How does uh, uh, Freud see it? How does, uh, uh, I mean, we did a whole lot of theorists. But, but then look at what he does in this test, which I didn't like, right? God, I'd rather be a pig and suckled in a creed I'd worn. That's because before I thought about it, Wordsworth is writing this in 1802 in a very, very, very Christian society. In a very modern society. In a very religious society. And he says, but I wouldn't dare say to you, because I am not. He said, I'd rather be a pagan. I'd rather not have all that Jesus stuff and the one God. I'd rather be like the Greeks. The, God, the, the universe is people by many gods for them, but they're alive and near and tingling. And for me, eh, getting and suing, see, spending, it moves us not. He says, great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed out worn. I'd, I'd rather believe in some old religion. Uh, I, I, I had a friend, my wife and I had a friend in India who came to teach in the United States. And I never forget the first class she taught about India. She says, you know, what you have to understand about India is Indians have a whole lot of gods. They don't just have one. The Greeks had a lot of gods. I mean, this is not about India. The Greeks had a lot of gods. And, and he, he said, I'd rather be a pagan. Because if I were standing on this kind of pleasant meadow, meadowy hillside, this pleasantly have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, I, I wouldn't feel as lost. Because the world would be peopled with, with animation, with, with things that, that I would feel the world was alive and moving, even if these were strange gods, like these minor sea gods, Proteus and, and uh, Triton. I, I, I would feel the world rather than if we go back one. He says, we are out of tune, it moves us not. So for Wordsworth, the great discovery, and, and here I'll really end, the great discovery was that by looking back to childhood, to what is within us when we take in the world in a kind of spontaneous way, to nature, to a time that was earlier than our own. Maybe things work better. Maybe we can find the source of what will give us strength as we move forward. Otherwise, we're going to live in dejection. That's the title of a poem by Coleridge. Otherwise, we're going to live in a world uh, for which we are out of tune that moves us not. So here's this poet writing in 1798 to 1802 who is shaping an understanding of the world that we inherit and shaping what is still, I think, our understanding of how we can move forward in that world. Find ourselves, listen to ourselves, listen to what we hear when we go into the woods.
pay attention not to the noises around us, but to the voices, the still voice within us. So thank you very much. Questions? Comments? Comments. Did you like Orange Wood? Was he okay? Was he okay? I, 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 before that, wait a minute. Was, was Wordsworth okay? I mean, yeah. Yeah. okay, good. Okay, I want to give you some quotes from Mark Julian. Um, two days ago, I was invited into the living room of an eighth grade girl in my neighborhood who writes poetry. And she had set one of her poems, something like, What Does It Mean to Me? and then about her life, to music. And she sings it. She's very good. And then when I leave here, I'm you going to see a young man who gave the poem and prayer opening for the legislature this past week or so. And his poem was very much like Wordsworth's story, um, The Trouble with Modern Man, his severed connection with the earth. And I'm going to get a copy of that. So things are going on with the young people. That, that, that was more of a remark than a question. If I uh, tell me if I summarize right, I, I, there's a young woman in Montpelier, not very old, who writes poems and sings them, and there's a, a source of hope. Oh, yeah. And then there was a guy who went before the legislature and said, everything sucks, like Wordsworth says. Right? So, did I get it right? I don't know what you said. <laughs> ah, there was somebody who went before the legislature and said, everything sucks. Oh, I thought that's what you were saying. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. She went before the legislature. Oh, no, I don't know that. Anymore. Okay. We missed it. We, we can pass the mic. We'll pass the mic around. Uh, questions? Pardon me for getting it wrong. It's not my question. Do you write? Yeah, let me. Can we connect them? Question there was do I write? And the answer was no. So, so I can't take it out. Watch work, he was really productive when he was younger. How did he support himself? He was productive when he was younger. How did he support himself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was old age, yeah. It's a good question. He, he, he was productive when he was young, and then he lived to an old age, and how did he support himself? You know, you can do things when you're young and live off it the rest of your life. I haven't managed to do that. <laughs> But uh, we just saw the passing of Kobe Bryant. I mean, he did everything. I mean, there, there was hope he would do other things, but he was a great basketball player when he was 25, you know? He could have retired then and lived off being Kobe Bryant for the rest of his life. So uh, the answer for Wordsworth is he, his poems, which didn't sell very much at first, became more and more acclaimed, and he became more and more famous and he became the poet laureate, and everybody wanted to have him come lecture or do this or that, and you know, he can make a living off that. Uh, it may not be the west, best way to go on being a productive poet, right? which he wasn't. So he kind of built off a reputation and lived, literally lived off that reputation afterwards. Is that good? I have a takeaway. Yeah. That, that image of um, the woman rolling with the rocks and trees and diurnal, that, that will be an image that I take away. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. Thank it's you. really powerful. So thank you for having me here. And I enjoy it. I want to say, I live in Burlington. I've lived in Burlington for most of my life, going on 50 years. I've always thought Montpelier was a better place to live. <laughs> so you're very lucky to live around here. Thank you very much for coming.